Hi, everyone. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. And thank you for finding the room, because I have not successfully found this room <laughs> until maybe quarter past. So, I don't know, I'm really no good with these maps. Um, my name's Catherine Devine. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm the Chief Digital Officer at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, which is a mouthful. Um, this is my colleague, Matt, who, Matt is also on the board of MCN. I'm sure like, he's more famous than I am. Some guy we decided to ditch the podium because, for a whole bunch of reasons, but actually we interrupt each other a lot. It'll, I'm sure, I promise you it'll be entertaining, but we can't agree on who's going to say what, so this is the way we're going to do it. So hopefully this works for people. So we're going to talk... No, nope, go back. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. We also can't agree on how to do the slides. So we're going to talk today about personalization. We've heard about personalization for years now. I'm sure to many people, personalization means something like Amazon's people who like this, like this, and that's been our experience. We're talking about another level of personalization here, so just to make sure that you realize that it was worth coming. So, um, but what we're talking about here is this idea, um, which we'll go through, but the idea that um, everybody sees something differently in your digital experiences. We've done this with apps, we are just doing it now with websites, and it's our intention as we go through this to actually talk about pr creating basically a different website for everybody. And you may wonder how we're going to do that, and we did too. And um, but anyway, that's, the, that's, that's what we're going to go through today. Um, really hope that you find this valuable, and um, obviously um, look forward to any questions. Um, feel free to jump in the middle too. Um, we'll let you know if we need to move on, but if you have questions, feel free. Um, Matt is, I said, I'm the CDO. Matt is, it's this really awkward title that we've never really resolved called Director Digital Architect, which I'm not even sure is correct grammar. But anyway, There's a comma. there is, we've never, it's, it's a long story. Um, basically, he's, dig, he's digital extraordinaire. He does everything. He does vision. He does architecture, technical architecture. He does experience architecture. He's worked at the museum for a long time. I do not come from the museum or from the United States, for that matter. And so he's my backup guy, along with all the other great members of my team. So in the theme of... Now you can move it. Oh. Yeah. You're just chief. Move the slides along. Um, <laughs> Director of slide advancement. There you go. <laughs> Uh, so in the theme of the conference, looking back, thinking forward, take action, just want to give you some little bit of context to, as to how we came about this kind of thinking. So 20 years ago is when websites came around, and I'm sure most of you remember that, but if you don't, it was a really, it was a really amazing moment because it meant that prior to that, you could go to a library, you could go to Encyclopedia Britannica, <laughs> if any of you remember that, etc. But suddenly, all this information was available, and it was available on the web, and this was only 20 years ago. And you just had this, it was like, it was like a kid in a, in a candy store. And, and it, it tra we trained people inadvertently to behave in a certain way and to accept a certain kind of behavior on websites. So what that meant is that people were really prepared to browse a lot. And you can move it. Yep, so we'll have to work out how to do this. People browsed a lot, and we're very happy browsing. And we, as institutions and ourselves and everything, talked endlessly about what was the best user experience that would allow people to discover the content that they were looking for or that might be interesting to them. And, and that's where the whole industry of user experience came up in information architecture. And I'm not suggesting that any of those things are not valid. I'm just saying that, you know, we spent a long time like, how should we create the navigation and what should be on it? And I'm sure all of you have sat through these meetings at various times, as have we. So then came along, that was just websites. Then we had, we had the physical world and then you had websites. And then came along all these other channels, smartphones, apps, wearables. There'll be more channels in the future. That's just what we have today. And then you, you realize that people... The website is not as important as it used to be. It's still important, but not as important. And you realize 
that people are actually carrying, and we start talking about journeys, this idea that people are actually going through a journey of an experience through you, which involves the physical space, a whole bunch of digital channels, and no longer is anyone really browsing. And that kind of started to go away when Google really like took on search in a big way. And no one's really browsing anymore that depending on the channel, they want what they want in that moment. And we discovered <coughs> that, I keep going, sorry. <coughs> This was our big revelation. <laughs> the revelation. That's a little overdone. We recognize that not only is everyone not looking for the same thing, right? Everyone is different, but actually, over your experience, what you are looking, what one individual is looking for differs substantially depending on where they are in the experience and what, m what channel they're using. see how this goes so you know so how can we take that idea of people stepping in and out of their experience with us and um, starting you know to visit the museum months before they actually show up and you know, all the user journey uh, ideas and how can we sort of understand what they're after and try to surface for them what they're what they're looking for um, and this so the idea and this is actually as Catherine alluded to this idea like with Google when you do a search nowadays, and I do a search, we're not getting the same results, right? Like this is just starting to become very obvious. But, but our website is still this is like one website for everybody, regardless <laughs> of um, of who they are, or what they need, or what they're after, and, and hence the importance of navigational structure and all this kind of stuff, which is a lot more work than people are willing to to really do. Um, so this this personalization really disrupts the way we thought about website, and. So rather than have one website for everybody, the idea was we have a different website for everybody. Right. Which so, which was like basically flipping that model completely around, which is a really great idea, but then how do you do it? Right. Which brings us to Explore, which yep. hopefully you all know about. Um, but Explore is our mobile app. It's got turn-by-turn -turn directions, and it's, you know, it's got all the highlights for the museum in it, and, and people can use it. It's also in Spanish and almost in French. Um, and, uh, but people can input their interests and then we will highlight things around them that, uh, that are gonna meet their needs. So in the beginning of a uh, first time user experience, they're asked, and they can edit this obviously, but they can uh, set up their interests and then we will tell them where they are, tell them what's interesting uh, and nearby, and then in this case, this is actually not interesting to them, which is why it's small, but we, because it's in the hall that they're in, we wanted them to know about it. So there's, sorry, there's this layering of of information that they might need. So everybody, just go back one sec. So this is the My List section. This is really the main page of the Explorer experience. So every single person who sees this sees a different page because it's a function of whether you've got tickets, whether you, what interests you selected, and where you actually are in the museum. And this was a really, you know, maybe it's not revolutionary, but. It's quite a different con it's a different way of thinking, and let me tell you, it adds all sorts of complexity to production and testing and all sorts of things, but it was also really well received by our visitors. But this was the origination of our thinking when we did it in apps, and now we're about to try and do it in websites. So thinking forward. Thinking forward. Personalization is you know, I like to say that it's it's nothing more than just a great experience. And I'm gonna tell you a story, <laughs> a very quick one, a story about what is a great personalized experience. So there's a brand, it's a startup in New York. I really love it. Um, don't know how I got involved in it, but I did. But anyway, one day they sent me an email and it had some new dress, top, jacket, something. It looked really good and um, I was thinking about buying it. But of course, the problem with buying online is you don't actually don't, if you're a woman, you'll understand this you don't actually know what the fabric's like, or you don't know what the quality is like, or whatever. So I actually used live chat, which I rarely use, but for whatever reason felt inspired to use live chat. So I used live chat, and I didn't even tell them who I was, but I guess maybe I was logged in or something. I don't know. And I said to them, can you tell me what this fabric is for this jacket? And they said, oh, Catherine, it is, and this was like, it probably was a robot, but it felt like a real person. This 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 uh, robotish thing said, <laughs> um, "Oh, Catherine, that's actually the same material as that top that you tried on last week." I was blown away, <laughs> and I still don't know how they do it, but and maybe there's no more science to it. Maybe there was a whole bunch of monkeys at the back or something like making it work. But the point is, that is a great experience, and it feels really personal and authentic, and doesn't feel like people like you like this. 
And I don't really realize that they've also got like, you know, this is now a $60 million startup, so they've got, you know, they've got a bit, fair bit of business. I don't know how they do that. The point is, that's what we're trying for, this like really like, I don't have to go hunting for what I want. It just arrives and I get a great experience. So that's my story about like, what I think is, a gr is my like iconic personalized experience and that's what we're aiming for. We're nowhere near there though. Yeah, it's a great, a great example of like, one of the issues that we're always dealing with is like, people's expectations, right? So Catherine's sort of out in front of these ideas because she's willing to expose herself to these startups and things like that. But at some point, everybody will make that expectation. Like, what did, like, I was, it was you I bought it from, you know what I mean? Like, uh, actually there's a, I'll talk about it later. <laughs> Don't get me started. So this is a great idea. Sounds really great. It's mm -hmm. so hard to do. And it was, you know, I thought it was going to be hard to do. It was way harder than I thought it was to do. So we want to take you on a small journey. This is an introduction, I think. Uh, we're not claiming to be experts. We're not even claiming to have this idea, like to invent it. We're just, you know, introducing it into the museum sector. What we've done, what we learned um, along the way, and try and make it somewhat interesting. So our first campaign. So you want to talk about this, Matt? Start somewhere. Um, so this was, we were trying to figure out, okay, given that we have a lot of people coming to our website uh, and we don't have the kind of behavior for, that Amazon has where they can just track you, generate a profile, and then make, us, make assumptions about what you want, we had to make sort of inferences. So we were like, well, what can we, what's the widest net we can make that we can make an inference and, and convince people, uh, 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 help people to get what they need? And so it was like, okay, well, a lot of people are coming to our website. Uh, if they're local to New York and they're on a mobile, uh, maybe they want to buy tickets, probably they want to buy, or maybe they're coming to the museum, that probably means they need tickets. But more importantly, like that group mm -hmm. are probably going to more likely to be buying tickets than people who are in Russia or Australia who are probably aren't buying tickets today. And so the whole idea of making ticketing, you know, part of their experience probably doesn't make a lot of sense. Right, and so this is actually an example of what Catherine said about like easier said than done. Like we only bolded New York, but if you, you know, there's like the word mobile in there and like, today and like there's a lot of factors in there that we need to somehow programmatically get our hands on so um, so if you're coming to the museum uh, what do you need is tickets um, so if you're in New York coming to the museum what do you look like all right well this is what you look like <laughs> but that's not an easy thing to understand uh, from a you know, computer perspective there um there are actually the might be yeah there's one guy there one a mobile phone this is what the front of our building looks like before opening time. So at 9.30 in the morning, we open at 10, around 9.30 people start congregating on the steps. Uh, they do the same across the park at the Met. Um, it's an interesting sight. <laughs> and, um, and we figured that this was a prime time to get you to buy tickets, right? What we know is that if you're in web channels, not mobile web, but web channels you buy in advance, but when you're on mobile channels, you're buying on the day. So we was like, how could we identify these people? So what would they look like to us as criteria? Actually, and s sidebar, if you look, see all those blue shirts? Yeah. Those actually say Explorer on them. So these are people out telling people to get Explorer so they can buy tickets online, which is, that's super personalized, right? <laughs> so we have, how do we do that without actually sending people out there with shirts on? Um, and so these are sort of a, a simplified version of what we're detecting for. So if you're on mobile, and of course we can't get this granular yet, but that's the ideal. Right now we're just doing sort of like Manhattan, New York area. Um, and it's at the morning, then you're probably buying um, tickets. So our analytics told us that like for reasons I don't quite understand, at four o'clock in the morning until roughly 11, that's when people are buying, there's like a big surge to buy tickets. Don't ask me who is getting up at four o'clock in the morning to be checking our tickets, but they are. And, um, and so we tried to just capture the audience who met all of these criteria. So this is, this is our homepage today. Now, if you were gonna buy a ticket, I don't know whether it's immediately obvious to you where you would buy tickets. It actually happens to be here and up here. And um, for those of you who are in the museum sector, you completely, we all are museum sector. Forgot where I was. Um, you'll know that we don't want to overemphasize revenue um, against mission. And that's a really important story. So we don't want to be all like, buy tickets, buy tickets, right? So our, our goal is, how do we make that just visible, the buy tickets, to the people who want to buy tickets? 
and to everybody else who is here for, the, for other reasons, and which there are many, we, we give them a different experience. So this is where we are today, and then we did a, a super subtle change. And excuse the fact that it's a different slide, but it's the same side. It's all we did was we made buy tickets. This gets this particular spot on the home page, gets, I don't know, 40, 50% of the clicks on that page. Um, doesn't matter what you put in there, <laughs> it gets 40 to 50% of the clicks. So we put buy tickets there, and it's super, super subtle. And it's a little like that experience that I was telling you about, about this startup. It's meant to be subtle. It's meant to be, you don't necessarily know that you're being personalized, so to speak. So it was super subtle, but it also did have a meaningful impact, which we'll tell you about in a minute. But what it did tell us to do is to try less subtle ways. So, so these are in the, in the queue right now, is this idea of what if we put a banner up there? And of course, a lot of people have banner blindness. So what if we got even less not subtle and you know, said, hey, you must be visiting us soon. You know, it's, it's, these are the kind of things that you know, people like us find terribly annoying, but somehow work. And then we have to apologize to the marketers who made us do it or whatever. But, um, so again, this is the sort of the kinds of data maybe you want to talk about. Sure. So just you know, going back to a little bit of maybe theory, um, we tried to group data. You, know, you have a lot of data available, and a lot of it is anonymous. And you can personalize even with anonymous data. So um, sometimes when we talk about personalization, everyone starts getting very concerned, and rightly so, about privacy concerns and things like that. I guess what I'm really saying, there's a lot you can do. So we, we d did it into you know, three groups. One is what I call situational data. So data which is about the time of day, where you physically are in the world, or even in New York or elsewhere. Um, what the weather is. Rainy weather drives traffic to the museum, um, like foot traffic to the museum. So we want to encourage people to come to the museum. Sunny, not so much. So one is situational data. One is data that you have shared with us. You've bought a ticket with us. You have a membership with us, et cetera. Um, and the other one, and you know, let me give you an example of how that might play out, right? right? If you're a member, we do not need to have the whole website tell you how to become a member. If which you're it a does now. Which it does now, as I'm sure that's maybe true of others as well. If you already have a ticket, we don't need to tell you how to buy a ticket. If you have a ticket, we need to tell you what to do with your ticket <laughs> when you arrive, what's the experience you know, that you should expect, where to, take, where to go, how to speed through with your mobile ticket, et cetera. If you're a member, we need to tell you how many benefits you have left, for example. Um, if you have X in a number of IMAX shows, we don't need to tell you. And, and you'd be amazed how much of our websites are all about the transactional and getting that first sale, but not about continuing that experience. So the last one is aggregated behavioral data. So what are, the, uh, what are the large patterns that we're seeing about people who behave in a certain way? Um, so you'd be amazed, in, and I'm sure you're not if you're into analytics, um, you'd be amazed how much commonality there is in people's behavior or trends. Now obviously no one behaves the same, but people tend to do the same thing. So people who are um, potentially buying a ticket, probably arrive, they come to a website a couple of times, they'll go to the plan your visit section, they won't purchase a ticket, and then they'll come back and buy a ticket later. Those kinds of trends, and then we can, we can create patterns like that, and when we see lookalikes to that, we can create this, do you want to come to the museum, buy tickets as you know, um, a more prominent feature. Let me also just say, I'm sure you're all very familiar with debates about real estate on the homepage. So this idea that, um, that on the homepage, you know, Everyone has a discussion about who's most important, has the most important message. This is the best way on earth to solve that problem because the audience who needs to get the message gets the prominent message and then it becomes less about um, who feels that their message is more important. So I like to think of it as like responsive design. Remember responsive design, but with more attributes. So remember responsive design was about basically creating a different website for people who had a certain device or viewpoint status. This is exactly the same, but now we're adding on more attributes. So now it's like you get this website if you've behaved in this way and it's raining and it's 20 degrees Celsius and or whatever, right? Everybody else gets a different website. It's also uh, these last two slides are the time to throw out things like 
Blue Chi and things like this. These are like aggregate databases you can subscribe to to get information that is uh, kind of criminally collected, but it's what everybody else is doing <laughs> about where, where people are going and what they're doing and what their preferences are and stuff like that. This, this is what Macy's is doing, not to call them out, but you know, it's what everybody's doing. Uh, so, so keep that in mind. But um, I want to make sure that um, I just circle back to the ROI point. That I, that's really important here. And this was an important learning for us. We started out with, well, we could personalize this way and we could personalize this way. And before you know it, we did a whole bunch of experiments, none of which actually paid off. Um, and then I realized, I probably should have realized it much earlier because I didn't really know what I was doing. This was really, I'm not saying that we're pioneers, but we, you know, we didn't have a lot to learn from. What I realized was, if it's not moving the needle, there's no point doing it, right? And so that's, I think that's a really important thing here, which is trying to anticipate the ones that will have the most impact and then measuring success and only implementing and doing them if they have the impact. Otherwise, it's a great idea, but it's, you know, it, ha it is ripe for getting very complex very fast. Well, un unlike some things that don't move the needle, these things you need to pull back out, right? Because it's adding complexity that you don't need to maintain if it's not paying its rent. So now we have a number of hypotheses and we're creating an experience that is based on a whole bunch of, um, I guess, hypotheses, for lack of a better word, <laughs> guesses. Um, and part of the important piece of this process is to actually validate those guesses against reality. So we are hypothesizing what you need, what you look like digitally if you need those things. <laughs> um, you know, how we will measure success, et cetera. Now, we could get all of that wrong, and I think that's really important sometimes with numbers where we look at numbers and we, we, we interpret them to be more real than they really are. And so it is always a function of the, you know, it's the garbage in, garbage out. You know, how well have we hypothesized that? So one of the things that Matt's been starting to think about is how we can put little um, escape hatches, I guess, for lack of a better word, into it so we can actually anticipate whether we created an experience that people wanted or we just annoyed them. Yeah, I'm making sure you may not have seen it, but in that banner, there's a like, no, I'm not planning a visit. And then that way we can put a cookie and then we know the feedback into the how do we assume this audience uh, going forward that you know, people are looking for things. So back to the theme of this conference. Taking action. So now there was this also minor point of um, how you would actually do this technically. Now, I am did not want to be doing um, coding. When I say coding, I mean like traditional coding where we come up with requirements, even in an agile way. We come up with requirements, someone codes it, and we build it. Because of the lead time and the expense of doing something that you don't yet know is going to work um, was not worth it. And so I was really looking for personalization platforms. And what I found is that we were somewhat before our time um, in that there wasn't a lot of platforms available. We have um, a relationship with Forrester, who's a uh, research um, agency um, who pretty much uh, didn't also have any great suggestions, although they do now. So we used Optimizely. Optimizely is an experimentation platform that allows you to do A-B testing, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It also has another tier that allows you to do personalization, which is basically an extension of that concept, but doing it in, um, so that we've decided to use Optimizely for one to two years while this space matures, uh, while the technology in this place matures, and also to actually see whether we get that return right? Because that will determine whether or not this was a failed experiment, but a good learning, um, or whether in fact this was, um, you know, a really great idea. So even with something like Optimizely, which is a low code environment, like there's still a fair amount of work that goes into There's a lot of thinking and planning and understanding audiences. So why bother? Well, you saw the, ignore that first little blip, but you saw the change that we made where we just moved the little tickets thing to the big tickets thing. And we saw, what did we see? So a 72% increase, in so we made that super subtle change, remember that, where we just put buy tickets on that front spot? And that one saw a 72% increase in people entering the ticketing funnel. Um, there could be many variables, right? We've been running it continuously since March, and this curve here you'll see is where we started the experiment. And it kind of came up here, and then it's kind of flattened out and pretty much stayed there. Um, so this feels to me like, you know, we're onto something here uh, for this particular campaign. However, there are many, many, many others that we could do. Our idea is we ultimately we might run 50 or 100 of these simultaneously, um, which brings us to our next point, how to actually scale this. 
So we don't know how to scale it, by the way, yet. We're just learning. Um, Matt has done um, um, a really great uh, like structure and process around how to plan out what is the campaign that we should be doing next, which one is likely to have the most impact, how we are proxying each of those elements, and, um, and then measuring it, and then iterating through it, and making a decision to kill or continue. Which, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that, that was good. Uh, well, no, they, I actually had a slide in here at one point that was like the, little, <laughs> the form that we fill out that's like, what's the audience, what's the experience, what's the, you know, there's a lot of factors that you need to sort of write in natural language, get, get everybody to agree that these are the right directions to go, and then you've gotta convert that into some kind of machine readable understanding. Like, how do I identify a perspective ticket buyer and things like that. And the answer is, is you just keep iterating, right? So like, say we've got that example we just showed you, but we're not identifying the actual ticket buying audience properly. We need to fix that and iterate without changing the experience that we're doing, right? We need to isolate these aspects of experience, audience, um, measure. How do you measure success of a thing like this? Like, and, and keep iterating over that. And so it's really tightly tied with the A-B, th A/B testing, you know, thing. So, um, so. Yeah. Oh. Um, and, and just one other point on that that I didn't do a slide about, but I think is really important and that we haven't yet sorted out, um, is the idea of collisions. So it's fine when you're running one, right? But what happens when, in terms of production load, and we can keep that in our heads as to whether the audience are mutually exclusive or whatnot, but what happens when we're, we might be running, say, 50 campaigns simultaneously that are, um, that are personalized how do we manage those collisions? Which takes first? What's the priority? How do, and then, in, as Matt has said many times, it like gets rid of this whole idea of a page view in yeah, analytics. Yeah, your analytics. It's like, you know, so there's a, lot to, there's a lot to unpack here that we haven't yet sorted out. I'm hoping that we'll come back next year and tell you um, a lot more about um, what our learnings have been and how we've been able to scale this and whether, in fact, it has uh, driven the kind of return that we've seen on, this, on these uh, first couple of campaigns. Um, and then just to say that, you know, um, not that I think we ever said it, but just in case, this is not our idea, right? We, are, we did not invent this for the world. This is out there in the commercial industry and has been for a long time. I gave you the example of the startup, um, which by the way is M.M. Lafleur. in case you're interested. Um, but New York Times does this and you don't even realize it. Um, and I'm sure many other newspapers do it as well, um, who are really leading in this space. They give you different headlines depending on who you are, where you are, what time of day it is, which device you're on. So not everyone is seeing the same headline for the same story. The later and in the day, the more alarming the headlines get. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not the New York Times, but others, yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, but the idea is, and they're experimenting all the time, this has a really strong thread to experimentation, with which headline has the most, um, has the most impact for that particular audience and time of day, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but you'll also see this in many others. Um, I was just at a conference a couple of weeks ago um, for Opticon, which is Optimize these annual conference. Now, there, as a museum, we were so far behind, so far behind these companies. It was amazing. And we had the BBC there, we had New York Times. We also had lots of little startups. There was this great startup called Roxbox, and they experimented with different, uh, it's, it's basically Netflix for jewelry. <laughs> if you can imagine. <laughs> so Netflix as it used to be when you took DVDs, right? And you know, they mailed them to you and then when you finished, you send them back and the same thing. Um, and they'd done all this experimentation and saw all these amazing conversion rates um, based on different language for different people and uh, different types of customers. So That's it. we're really passionate about this, love to chat. Now, later on Twitter, etc. Feel free to hit us up. We have one minute. And we have one <laughs> minute. <laughs> yeah. um, do you see a, a, a change in the number of tickets that were sold on site? Did that number go down? Uh, buying yes. So right now, um, my um, my digital tickets are twenty percent of my total sales. Um, so the number was not sufficient to materially move. Um, it did, but it, it was hard to. Um, isolate it from other noise, but yes, that would be the intention that we layer on more and more campaigns in such a way that we do actually see movement in that one as well. Specifically, yes. this was a channel shifting campaign, shifting channels from on-site physical to digital ahead of time so that the benefit of skipping the line and things like that was obvious. Yep. One more? Yep.
there's a little bit of I don't know what I'm looking for um, because, you know, um, there are greater thinkers than us in this space, <laughs> in the commercial world. Um, so right now when I would look at it, I would say I want something that's more efficient and it's easier to manage, to see results, to manage collisions, um, to, you know, deal with multivariate analysis, those kinds of things. I would love all that, right? Um, at this I was just gonna, Amazon probably has 100 engineers and UX designers, and so what we need is, hey, Optimizely, here's our money, let's do this, you know yep. what I mean? Um, and then, but, that, but then if I, I don't know what, I need, what to ask for, um, but it may turn out that, you know, I'm looking for people who are less technical to be actually set these campaigns up, that maybe marketing can just be, you know, plug and play um, in a way that they probably couldn't with this right now, you know, as an example. Um, you had a question as well. Oh, okay, so um, we know things about the user from, I mean, these are things that they've explicitly told us because, sorry, I didn't go into that at the time. Um, so we have a CRM database that tries to, tries to get a 360 degree view of the, of the visitor. So if you're doing a transaction, by definition, we're gonna have the transactions in there. So we know that you've transacted it with us. If you are on the website and you have created a login and then you've expressed preferences, then it's also feeding into that. So that's how we know those things. So in those preferences, we, we ask people, do they like space more than dinosaurs? Um, and so that allows us to actually like, you know, find people who like space more, for example. Yep. We're being very careful and very, very cautious about um, uh, privacy and, and not trying to, you know, do things without people having explicitly told us or knowing how, they would, how we would know that information. I think we're over time, but yeah, feel free. Thank you. Do you know how old the users are? What happens if you're running around on the site? Do you have this same consideration? Yes, we have, um, and I'm not going to speak for our legal team here, but there is a whole thing on the site, regardless of personalization, which is around whether or not you're 13 or more, and, um, and where we have, um, you can't, you know, you have to explicitly say that you, you're more than 13 to create a profile, that kind of thing that you've seen on other sites. Thanks. Um, I think we're out of time. Great.